On today's episode of Inside Startup Investing, you will be hearing from the founder and CEO of a company called Pinwheel. His name is Dave Whitbeck, and he's a serial entrepreneur that I think you're really going to enjoy getting to know. In one line, what they're doing at Pinwheel is creating magic software for parents to make sure their children can have access to a phone without having access to all of the apps and social media that can be detrimental to a child's mental health and safety. The three things on this episode that really stood out to me are one, how complex it can be for a parent to manage a child's relationship with a phone, especially in those formative years between the ages of 10 and 16. The second thing that really stood out to me is how much market opportunity actually exists for a business like this. This is a company that's been growing well over 100% year over year and is on pace for over $8 million in revenue this year alone. And the last ki- one that was really interesting to me is just the fact that kids, surprisingly, don't want to have the same unhealthy relationship that they see their parents have with their smartphones today, which is maybe a knock on adults today and the unhealthy relationship we all have. But I'm really glad to have a company like this that's trying to prevent another generation from having a very addictive behavior towards their smartphone. So if you like consumer businesses or you're a parent, I think this is the episode for you. So let's kick it off. So we'd love to start off with, let's hop into who you are and how you came to found Pinwheel. Yeah, sure. So you could say I'm a serial entrepreneur since this is number two. I started a company back in 2011 called Meshify, which is an IoT platform company. Did that for five years, sold it to a big German conglomerate called Munich Re, did two years on an earnout there. And then when I came out of that, I wanted to do it again. It's a bit addicting to start companies. Once you have done it, it uh, there seems to be no other direction you want your career to take. So I went through a very deliberate sort of startup lab mode where I was looking at several different ideas and really wasn't being too close-minded about it. I was really just trying to be open to inspiration hitting me. And early on in that process, I became really interested in family tech. You know, I had an experience where I was with my kid at a flag football game and I was running around the track where, you know, there was nobody on the far side of the field and, uh, and, and except a parking lot. And, and uh, I saw a dad sort of coming out of a vehicle with a kid. He didn't know anyone else was around and he was having a bad day and he was just sort of laying into this probably 11, 12 year old. And, you know, I think we've all been there. If you've been a parent, it's a rough day, but it just really struck me how much people are struggling sometimes um, with sort of their family dynamics. And it really, you know, the lens I look at the world through is technology. And that kicked me off into looking at tech and families and how could we bring families together and closer through technology. My first attempt at that was a watch app. It was a direct response to what I saw and witnessed there. It was an emotional regulator. So it would look at your voice and use AI to sort of give you feedback on, on your emotional uh, regulation. That one didn't quite pass the marketing test. I found that everybody who heard about it and that I surveyed about it said, I know three people that need that and I could tell them about it right now, but I'm definitely not one of them. So nobody uh, wanted it for them, but a lot of people were interested in the idea. But it really, my mind was in families and tech when my oldest kid's best friend got a hand-me-down cell phone. And that's what really kicked off my interest in, okay, I thought I had more time with phones and kids. Let me dive in on this problem set. And so then I did all the deep research on past solutions, current solutions, um, Apple solution, Android solution. And what I really found was that there was this hole in doing, uh, sort of raising your kid in a tech saturated world in a well thought out way. So everyone was focused on safety and I love safety too. I want my kids to be safe uh, as they use technology, but we're not a safety brand. We really are an, more of an education brand. We're about trying to bring, um, you know, parents' tools and kids' tools to help them know how to use a smartphone and really personal technology the right way to leverage it for them. So it's about reaching your goals and about accomplishing what you want to accomplish and having this be a help to you and not a hindrance. Love when it could kind of come, you know, it, you're open to all these ideas and exploring things, and yet it ends up just being kind of a personal experience, right, that really drives you towards it. Um, I'm curious, did you have, you know, kind of a, I don't know, a passion for this type of space prior, or is it really just the inspiration that's kind of created this drive and desire to have this company come to life? 
No, I've had, a, I say I would have, I've had a personal productivity passion my whole life, right? Like I've been very into personal productivity, thinking about my own, thinking about my own mental state and how I can be the most productive I can be. I've been somebody who's used tools on my own phone to try to limit its ability to distract me from my own goals. And so I think as an adult, you know, I definitely have been somebody who's into this space. And then as a, as a dad, sort of the thought of dropping my kids into sort of the dopamine rich environment that I struggle to manage day to day, knowing where they're at in their development and their brain development, it's like just throwing them in with no chance, like no chance of success whatsoever. And I just could not fathom bringing myself to want to do that for my kids. And I think a lot of parents are in that spot where they're just like, no smartphone. It's just, you know, like, I'm just going to wait as long as possible. I'm just going to do nothing, right? I'm going to give them a flip phone or I'm going to give them, you know, a watch or I'm going to give them nothing. I'm just going to do nothing because they have the same thought and fear that I had. I'm not going to, they're not going to be able to handle this. Like there's no way they're not equipped. And so I thought that, uh, I thought they had that same instinct, but I think the, the nuance there is that it's not really the tool. It really is uh, the apps and thinking about which type of experiences you expose your kids to. And for how long? And there just was no tooling that helps you slice that in the right way before pinwheel, right? Everything was either nothing or everything. And even on the parental control side, when it's like everything but parental controls, there's nothing to really give you guidance as to what's good, what's bad. You still have this massively overwhelming task of sort of looking at every app and wondering, should I give it to my kids and your kids perusing the app store? And then even if they're not allowed to download it, sort of looking and begging you for this game or that game. So it's just this, it, it was into this environment that I said, Hey, there's just a better way here. Like there should be a better solution. And uh, that's what we founded Pinwheel around. At its most basic level, would you say it is a smartphone that is thoughtfully designed for young children and teenagers who are up and coming to provide what they need? without providing them, as you mentioned, kind of all of these dopamine-driven, response-driven apps with constant notifications and all of the social medias and all of these things that can have negative implications. Is that is that what it is? We have taken the route of selling the software with the phone, but we're not really a hardware company, right? Like we are a software company. All we write and make every day is software. But one of the struggles the parents have is just one is setting up a parental control system. It's really daunting. It can take an hour and a half to two hours and be like over 40 steps to set one up. A lot of parents give up and don't even get it done. And then the other side is loopholes. So once you set it up, it's very complicated to keep on top of. And so all these other competitors were doing things like trying to support every single Android and every single iPhone out there. And so we really narrowed the surface area. That's one of the things we did was narrow the surface area. So we pick certain phones. We don't make the phones. We get them from Samsung or the Google Pixel right? But we pick certain models and we load on not just one piece of software, but about seven pieces of software. And we do that before the parent ever gets it so that when you get the phone, it's set up as a kid's first phone. So it really is um, meant to be a kid first phone. So it starts very simple and then it expands. So it's got the capability on the parent side to access a parent portal either on web or on, on Apple or on Android. It doesn't matter what you have for your side as the parent. You can access it through any of those means. But you get a guidance tool that allows you some invisibility and control into your kid's device and then helps you unlock things as they're ready for it, right? So um, a good example is contact management. When you first get a phone for a kid that's 10 years old, you know, you may want to prove every single contact yourself. Uh, you don't know. You just want to put grandma in, aunts, uncles, whatever. You're sort of managing it for them. By the time they hit 11 and a half or 12, it's like, hey, they've got their friend group. They can manage their own contacts, but you want oversight over that, right? So you turn it over to them. They can now add in their own contacts, but if they don't add it and you don't add it, it's blocked. So it still is an opt-in process, but at least they're in control of it. And then there's a third tier. Once they hit 14, 15, maybe they've got a part-time job. Maybe, you know, uh, they're ordering pizza, you know. They need phone numbers to be able to hit their phone more freely, and they're also able to handle that. So then you take that off and you just have review only access. So then everything's coming into your phone like a regular phone, but that block list that on a normal phone, on your and my phone, we have block lists, but this has a parent has access to that block list and the kid has access to that block list. So 
both can now add onto that block list rather than that it acts like a normal phone. So that's just one example of thinking through the contact management all the way from 10 to 15, 16, how it's not the same and it grows with your child. Uh, and we've done that same type of thinking in other domains uh, of access on the phone so that it really works well as that first flexible phone to get them up into high school. One other thing I'd just be really interested to hear is like app management slash social media management. What do you do on that front? So we have a hard line, no social media stance at our company. So we have a research backed, you know, stance on this, which is that for kids under the age of 16, really there should be no social media in our opinion. And customers that buy into Pinwheel generally take that same philosophy. Other parents may have a different philosophy. That's fine. It's not the right product for you. Um, once you're post 16, you know, we have a, we, we are more okay with starting in on social media, but really our phone is really great for post 16 anyway, uh, as it sits today, we're working on more for that segment, but for right now, it really is sort of 10 to 15 is really where we fit the best. And it's a first phone product. So no social media really whatsoever. On the app management front, we curate every app that's available in our app library. So we don't use the Google Play Store. We don't use um, Apple iOS Store, right? We have our own app store, and it's got over a 1,000 apps in it. It's got apps you've heard of. It's got Spotify. It's got, you know, Pokemon Go. It's got a lot of apps that you would heard of and what your kids would want. It's got all your school apps, so everything they need for school. But what we do is we actually curate that app set. So we look at every single app and we do that job for parents. We write then a description for every app from a parent's perspective. We put warning labels on them. We let you know what's in it. And so it's really that information rich environment that you get as a parent when you come onto our website or you open our app that parents tell us over and over again, they really value. And then it's not just the information, but it's the tool and the information combined in one so that it's really easy to manage. Okay. This app's fine for on the weekends, We'll let them, you know, wander around on Pokemon Go on a Saturday, you know, whatever. But when they're in school, that would be really distracting. We don't want them catching Pokemon and Pokeballs at school, <laughs> right? Um, so that's going to distract from their study. So we have tools to then put it into mode. So you've got school mode, you've got uh, weekend mode, and different apps can be available at different times of day. Same with contacts um, and that sort of thing. Could be Different ones can be available at different times of day. And uh, yeah, so that content is really um, very curated for a parent. And if you have an app that's not in our library, we have a button that says request an app and you request the app and you can write in what you think about it as a parent. And we have a review team that reviews it and we're approving apps all the time every week. So we're adding to that library really in partnership with our parents and our, our customers. So it's really a community driven approach. You know, this is one of those companies where when I saw it, it was just like a, oh my God, how did this not exist? This makes all the sense in the world. Um, it, it just hits because I, I feel like every parent I've ever spoken to, whether it's an aunt, an uncle, someone that I just know, someone I work with, like no one likes the experience of giving their child a phone because of the world that it opens up in this world where it's all smartphones and there's too much access to too many things and it's nearly impossible to control. So it's just like, when I heard it, I was like, yep, this has to exist. Makes sense why you've had such tremendous traction. Um, but would love to understand how you've been able to drive that traction. I mean, if you look at your sales have been growing really robustly. I mean, is this all direct to consumer or are you finding another way to grow the business? Uh, today, it is all direct to consumer. So we have uh, the phone available on pinwheel.com and also at amazon.com. So it's on both of those channels. And you can buy it in either place, uh, but it is a direct consumer brand today. And we have you know, done that through a number of means. You know, we started out with basic Google ads and Facebook ads and Instagram ads and got those to sort of work and got them dialed in. We expanded to an affiliate network. So we have a bunch of friends of the company who, you know, post online about us and like us and they get sort of a commission driven structure on anybody who they've introduced to the company. Very common consumer um, channel there. And now we've sort of grown up into, I would say, medium level influencers, right? And we're just signing deals now with influencers like Rafi Jacobs, who is a really known in the parenting space for middle schoolers and high schoolers, especially as being uh, someone who's really thoughtful about what she does with her kids and how she raises her kids in a number of different ways and loves our phone, uses it with her kids and now is signed on to amplify the brand. And she's actually, um, you know, become an ambassador for us. So that Pinwheel Premier Partnership Program's grown to her. We've also got 
another one called Jay House, who's more of a travel blogger. You know, his family's traveling the world and they're posting on YouTube these, you know, sort of million view videos that are really fun and engaging about what they're doing around the world. Also a big fan, fan of Pinwheel and his kids are bringing it with them on their trip around the world. And so those kind of, he has, you know, millions of followers. So those kind of um, and brand ambassadors we're bringing on and we want to do more of that going forward because it's such a good amplification of the brand and gets the word out about us so effectively. Uh, the other thing that I'm really excited about is more of the B to B to C channels. So how do we partner with another big company and introducing Pinwheel to their audience? And you can imagine some some common targets for us would be like carriers, right? We don't sell the cellular service. We just sell the phone and software and you can activate it anywhere. So going through a cellular carrier and saying, hey, why don't you sell your cellular service with this unlocked phone? Great potential channel for us. And we've gotten deals with uh, companies like Mint Mobile um, through through things like that. And, and uh, still those are being bought on our site, but the next stage is really to sell it through their channels. And uh, I'm excited about that possibility. Also, the smartphone OEM manufacturers themselves. So you imagine there's a lot of these OEMs out there that are that are looking for differentiation and differentiated service. So how do we sell Pinwheel directly embedded into some of those phones, right? So that you can just unlock it. And then it could be Pinwheelized sort of on the fly, right? So we're working on on deals like that as well. Diving in on that, you know, people will argue all the time when they look at D2C companies, they worry about the sustainability of growth. So can you talk about a, is it just so crucial that you kind of win this B2B2C business, right? Selling through the Verizons and the T-Mobiles over the long term, or can you make a real go of it going completely direct to consumer? Yeah, I think we already have made a pretty good go of it going direct to consumer. So I think we will continue to grow that channel. I think the business just on a direct to consumer basis is going to be a big and sustainable and, and great business. So we've got a lot of growth in front of us on the D2C front. Um, I think our ambitions are are large, right? We want to make a difference in sort of humanity. We want to make a difference for everyone. And so getting to our ultimate goal of how do we affect the maximum number of kids and the maximum number of families and and make sure that you know tech is positioned in a healthy way for as many young people as it possibly can be. Um, I do think that it's key to get more uh, scalable distribution in place to reach that ultimate goal. But I think we'll be successful as a business, you know, in both cases, it's just a, a scope of ambition thing. And our, our ambition is large and the impact we want to make is large. One of the questions that I really have tired of um, that often comes from investors is well, why don't the big players do it, right? Why doesn't Samsung or Apple just do this? Um, and I, I would argue, when have we ever seen massive incumbents do anything innovative, right? They just wait for this startup to get big enough and they acquire it or they get beat out by them. But the incumbents are never looking to disrupt themselves. And so they kind of keep with the status quo. So I actually think it's a terrible question. The question I would ask is, um, why don't they want to do this? And is there even a reason why they wouldn't want to see this come to fruition? For the standpoint of, there's, you know, it's a different answer maybe for different large companies. And I'm, you know, I'm, I have my own perspective. So this is just a little bit of me. Um, giving my own thoughts on it. I, you know, I know I have inside information, obviously, at, at, at Apple or Samsung or Google or any of those companies, but I think at Apple in particular, right, they're really built for privacy first. You see the lock on the advertisements. You know, Apple stands for privacy, and really it's about that user's privacy. It's about them. You know, you saw a couple of years ago, Apple actually built an incredible child sexual abuse material detection algorithm on AI, so that iMessage itself could detect CSAM. That's what this acronym is for child sexual abuse material. It could detect CSAM in an algorithmic AI-driven way and prevent it from spreading online. Fantastic idea. Great execution. They built it all out. They get ready to launch it. They do the press release. And you know what happened? They got massive backlash from their customer base and their investor base of, this is spying on us. You're going to tell me that you're looking at the images that I'm putting into my iMessage, you're looking at everyone and specifically you're looking for sexual stuff. It seems gross to me. And so they have this problem of standing for privacy for their entire user base and all of their phones. And that's at odds with protecting kids and doing what's right for kids. And so this one niche, that's actually a small economic niche in the terms of Apple, right? It actually is at odds with a lot of the rest of what they want to do with their phone. And it puts them in a difficult spot. It's kind of the same with the app store, right? Like we've curated every app, we've done so for on parents and kids' behalf. We have philosophical 
um, sort of directives around, hey, we don't want social media for kids under the age of 16. Apple simply can't take that stance, right? They're, these two are their partners. You know, TikTok is their partner. Um, Pinterest is their partner. You know, these social media companies, they're partners of Apple's and they make a ton of money off of the App Store revenue model and they can't so easily pick and choose and say, yes, you're good, no, you're bad, right? They just can't do that and really maintain their brand positioning of being open to the entire market and being, you know, sort of who they are. So they're really hemmed in and being able to solve this problem the same way as a smaller company can. Um, and so that's, that's one of the answers there. On the Android side, I think they have a lot of the same problems with the app ecosystem and that sort of thing, uh, where it's hard to separate those things out. Um, and then I think all these big companies just have a problem of generally needing to focus on the next big platform shift, right? Like Apple's coming out with, you know, Apple Vision Pro, which is what they should be doing as a the one of the largest companies in the world. They should be looking at the paradigm shifts in, in compute. And that's what they're doing, right? They're putting out products that are going to be whole new platforms for the entire world to innovate on and to drive us forward into the next stage of human evolution. So in some sense, this is also very kind of small and niche and a small amount of the market from their perspective. From my perspective and from uh, the perspective of, I think, investors that would look at our company, there's a huge amount of growth and a very large company that can be built here. But I think it's hard for them to shoot every market, you know, with the same emphasis that they do, that they go after sort of, you know, massive, you know, human changing compete platforms, which is where they should be spending their capital. So not every company can do everything. I and mean, that's just the way it is. That limitation of usage goes against everything that they stand for, which is how do we make this product more addictive and get people to use their phone even more? And, you know, you could say it's evil. I mean, it's a business objective, right? They they need you to use that product, want to use the product and continuously come back. Um, and that's what they're trying to do. So having a product that creates all those limitations um, for a, a meaningful segment of customers probably doesn't make a whole a ton of sense to them. From that, I, I think, you know, we, we both uh, believe that there's a real market opportunity here and a real business to be had. And, and you've proven that with your traction to date. Um, talk to me about the business model. How do you make money from Pinwheel? Yeah, so there's two primary ways. We sell the hardware up front and we sell a subscription to the software. So like I talked about, we don't make our own hardware, but we do buy mass bulk of uh, hardware at a discount so we can get wholesale rates on that hardware by buying in bulk. And then we're able to sell that at a retail price. So there's about a 32% margin on, on generally on a hard piece of hardware that we sell, which is, uh, you know, people are surprised. They think that's, you know, it's like more than they would expect on a, on a software, on a smartphone today, but you know, that's what we're able to, to get. And then on the, um, on the software side, we're selling either monthly or annual subscriptions to the parent, essentially the parent guidance uh, system. Every phone that's sold comes with that subscription. So there's not like a choice to be made there. It just comes with it. Uh, and everybody who buys the phone is a subscriber, essentially. Uh, if you have a second kid or a third kid, that lowers in price. So it's either you know $15 a month for the first kid, $5 for each additional. So we have people with multiple kids on Pinwell and they don't have to pay the full price for every subscription that comes with it. Uh, but yeah, those are the... It's, pretty basic. Those are the two things that we sell. And I imagine stickiness is, is relatively high on these things. Through our age group, certainly. Yeah. For the, for the first phone market, uh, the main source of churn for us is people graduating, right? Graduating successfully. You know, we've done our job for that family. We've helped the kid get through middle school into high school and, uh, their parents are not having major trouble with them in, in the digital realm, largely thank, thanks to, you know, our combination, our partnership with us and those parents, and they're ready to trust those kids at the next stage. And so that's the main source of churn for us is just kids being ready for the next product. And, uh, we're okay with that. Uh, I think there is more we can do though, for sort of the 15 to 18 segment. It's a kind of a different product. It's more about them than it is about the parent. It's much more sort of teen focused. And so we're doing a lot of talking with teens and a, a lot of focus groups there to see what we can do to, to if there's if there's service to to be had there, which we think there are, there are things that we can do that those those teens want. Then um, we'd be happy to provide that, right? And I think it, it's amazing talking to them. I'll just say this anecdotally. You know, you would think that a teen is like, "Oh, just stay out of my life, like do nothing, right? Just give me the whole thing." 
And we're finding that's not the case. Like when you ask a teen, especially a 16 year old plus, do you want the same relationship with your smartphone that your parents have with theirs? You get a visceral reaction of no. It's like they've been hurt by that relationship their parents have with the smartphone. You can almost see it in their response of like, you know, at times I feel the parents, I see my parents are addicted to that smartphone. I see how, what it means to them. And like, I want my relationship with it to be better. And that's what the parent wants too. We all want our relationships to be more healthy with smartphones. And so when you frame it that way for them, they actually are very open to help when it's centered around them um, at the teen stage. So we think there's more we can do there, but I, I won't say more about you know, what we want to do because it's not launched yet. But I think there is there is a more product to be built there to extend into that segment. But the segment that we're in now is highly valuable and very exciting and lots of growth to be had. From what I'm hearing, it feels as though if you capture them early in that 10, 11 range, they could be around for you know at least four to five plus years. Um, which from a lifetime value perspective actually seems really, really good. Um, now to kind of understand, you know, projected to do 8 million this year in revenue, um, growing really, really well over the past few years. Um, when you look to the future, help us understand kind of the, the real market opportunity that exists out there for you to go after. Yeah, this is the most exciting thing about being part of a consumer company and really, um, you know, looking at the the market size. It's just so vast, right? The number of kids and families out there. It's uh, consumer companies can just keep growing and growing uh, as long as they can keep finding, you know, more ways to get in front of more eyeballs, right? Because there's just almost an unlimited set of them that can keep that you can keep growing into. And so, yeah, like I talked about, we're very excited about the B two B to C opportunity. I haven't talked much about international expansion, but we are only sold in the USA today. There's a whole market out there of international expansion of families that are dealing with the same things all over the world, and a lot of those countries are English speaking. It would be you know fairly quick to reach, and other ones uh, would require translation and things like that. That would be next stage. But I think that's another you know huge area of growth to look to when you look at market size, and so that's really just growing in looking at what we're doing today, right? I think any consumer company is going to have to think about their products in terms of a lifespan. When you start to really zoom out and look at a successful consumer company, right? Uh, over the course of decades, they're not selling the same product, you know, decade after decade. The product has to be, they have to refresh and they need a new product. They need something new and they need to serve, you know, more people with more products. And so, I think, um, you know, we're not quite there yet. We're still a young company. You know, we've only been in market three years this month, right? Um, so still just very, very young. But as I zoom out and look at what we want to become, I look at us as a multi-product company eventually that can really help humanity as a whole to manage their relationship with personal technology and make sure that it's always serving them first and foremost. And I think that's the lens that we look at the world through. And, uh, and I think when you look at it through that lens, there's a lot of opportunity in front of us. For those who are listening in and are, you know, interested in investing or kind of on the line, what's kind of your final pitch to them? When you look at a company like ours, you know, win, lose, or draw, would you ever regret backing something like this? Would it ever be something that you would say, oh, I wish I wouldn't have tried to bet on this being the future? And I think that's how I looked at it. Uh, you know, I had a lot of the same fears probably that investors today will have when I looked at betting my whole life down this direction. And ultimately, that was the frame that I took in putting my own money, time, and effort into this is I can't imagine a future where I ever say, win, lose, or draw. I'm, um, I'm, I'm you know, upset that I made this bet on the future of humanity, that I pushed for this direction, that I pushed for humans over technology, that I pushed for us to be you know, at the center and not, you know, controlled by technology, but really the masters of it. Like that's, if you believe in that and you want that future, then I would say make a small bet and come join us and come along for the journey. We'll be happy to give you updates along the way and and turn you into an ambassador and help you and, and get your help spreading the word and uh, come and join us. It'll be fun. Thank you, Dane. This has been a wonderful conversation. Um, very much believe in the importance of the company that you're building. And I'm glad to see it having uh, as much success as it has to date. Thank you, everyone, for listening and have a wonderful day. Thanks so much for listening to the show. If you want to use the same tools I do to find amazing founders like the ones I have on the show to power your investment decisions, 
you can head on over to kingscrowd.com backslash startups to try out our Edge Toolkit for 30 days free.